It's now been 10 years since Moscow illegally annexed Crimea. The occupation uh, followed an invasion of where, using troops who didn't wear Russian insignia. It was the beginning of a decade-long war with Ukraine, which culminated in the full-scale invasion two years ago. Crimea's location on the Black Sea makes it a strategically important asset. The peninsula serves as a key base for naval fleets and is used to safeguard Russia's security interests in the region. Crimea is also home to ethnic Russians and to Ukrainians, as well as indigenous Crimean Tatars and others. For centuries, the Tatars have fought to preserve their identity, as Crimea was invaded by various powers. Our next report follows Tatars in exile, who dream of one day returning to their homeland. It's Ramadan in Kyiv. Many of those praying here are far from home, such as Ismail Kurt Umer. The 33-year-old is Tatar, an ethnic group native to Crimea. I was born in independent Ukraine. I grew up in Crimea, in independent Ukraine. I don't see Crimea as different. I do not see it as part of some other state. Ismail left Crimea after Russia occupied the peninsula in 2014. The singer joined the Ukrainian armed forces and now performs in a military ensemble. Here, singing a song in his native language, an ode to Crimea. Going home, even to visit, has become impossible. Until 2014, the people were free in Crimea. That is, if Ukraine didn't really help us there, at least it didn't interfere. No one told us what holidays to celebrate, what days of remembrance we should celebrate or not, what language we should speak, who to vote for, who not to vote for, who to praise or not to praise. Nobody told us this. Tatars have been living in Crimea for hundreds of years, under Stalin, they were persecuted and deported. The collapse of the Soviet Union allowed them to return. That freedom didn't last. Since Russia's occupation in 2014, Tatars are again being persecuted, making up the largest group of political prisoners. Around 50,000 Tatars are reported to have left Crimea since 2014, while the Ukrainian government estimates more than 500,000 Russians were brought in. When Russian President Vladimir Putin annexed Crimea, he promised the lives of ordinary people would improve. Instead, sanctions have impacted the economy and democratic rights have been lost. We see the destruction of cultural heritage, the impossibility of using one's native language in educational institutions or in public space. Therefore, these are very important things when we describe how people live in Crimea. That is, it's the territory of fear. Tamila Tasheva says when Putin invaded Crimea, the world looked away. The occupation is seen to have paved the way for the full-scale invasion of 2022. Today, liberating Crimea seems like a daunting challenge, but for Ukraine's government, it's not up for debate. There's no doubt that only liberation of absolutely all territories will bring us peace. For Ismail, there will be no peace until he can return home. I believe in Allah and hope that everything is the same. With his permission, Crimea will still return to Ukraine and there will be safe access and passage for someone like me. Crimean Tatars fear a prolonged occupation could mean the end of their people. Alexei Goncharenko is an opposition member of the Ukrainian parliament and joins us from Kyiv. Welcome to DW. Uh, the issue of Crimea, I think, has become subsumed in the wider war, certainly for the outside world. I, I wonder if you think the Ukrainian government is doing all it can to liberate Crimea. Yes, definitely, Ukrainian government is doing everything uh, they can and Ukraine is doing everything we can to restore completely Ukrainian territorial integrity and it means to liberate Crimea. And is uh, the liberation of, of Crimea a realistic goal? I know inevitably uh, you will say yes, but 
as we as this war passes the the, the two year mark, increasingly we're, we're hearing people saying, "Well, Russia has that now. Let's deal with this full scale invasion and essentially let them have that." Uh, no, it's impossible to let them uh, have this because that will mean that there is no international law in the world and there is no international order in the world. So it's not just for Ukraine, it's for everybody, it's important. And yes, it is realistic, but the question is when. I'm not telling you that this will happen tomorrow, uh, but I'm sure this will happen one day. And, uh, you know, it can be quite unpredictable and quickly. I think many people just three, four years before Berlin Wall fault would not believe that it would happen. So uh, sooner or later, Crimea will be under Ukrainian control. Except that now Vladimir Putin has been re-elected for another uh, six-year term and can go on and on until excuse he either... Me. Excuse uh, me, may I interrupt you? May I interrupt you? Because I think to use the word re-elected is not right at all. Okay. There were no elections in Russian Federation. He was not elected. That was the coronation of Russian side. You can call it in any way, but it is dictatorship. And there Understood. were no elections in Russia. All Putin's uh, political enemies are either killed or in prison. So we can't call it election at all. Okay. Either way, he's there for another six years at least and can go on for 20 if he chooses and doesn't die. Uh, so is force the only way that Russia will relinquish uh, Crimea, do you think? I think uh, that uh, yeah, definitely Putin tries to show Crimea as a, his ultimate prize. But again, uh, that doesn't mean uh, much for me. What it means, definitely, uh, Putin's Russia will never uh, give up Crimea voluntarily. Yes, I understand this. But I'm sure that uh, sooner or later, Russian Federation will fall down like it happened with the Russian Empire, then with the Soviet Union, and this new iteration of Russian Empire will also fall apart. And uh, I don't have any doubts in this. Will it happen during Putin's life, or which will happen at the moment of his death? I don't know how it will happen, but I know for sure that it will happen. And one more thing about these so-called elections, I just want to raise your attention that Putin is no more legitimate president. Because the fifth term, with such kind of an entire theater of absurd, which he showed with these elections, including on occupied Ukrainian territories, and uh, uh, also last year there was a resolution of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe saying if Putin would go for another term, he would be illegitimate. And he is now illegitimate. Right. Um, again, forgive me for, for, for speaking about... Um uh, Crimea, in, uh, because I, I, I'm looking at it from outside and perhaps it's different uh, looking at the situation uh, from inside and from within the war, but uh, we don't hear so much about it uh, anymore. And one wonders, after 10 years of occupation, are there any resistance forces left in Crimea? Um, yes, we see that and we have information from Crimea and we know that there are operations which are held in Crimea with also, also with the help of uh, resistance, uh, which is present there. It's very hard uh, to in Crimea because there is no law and Russia is uh, uh, torturing people, keep taking them to jail with no reasons, with no justification. So it's very difficult there. But still there are people in Crimea who are waiting for Ukraine uh, to be back. Right. So President uh, uh, Zelensky uh, replaced his uh, supreme uh, military uh, commander uh, recently. Uh, is uh, the president himself doing enough to secure uh, this uh, victory in this war? Um, I think that president is doing his best as a commander in chief now. I have a lot of questions how President Zelensky prepared the country for the war, how he reacted on the information that Russia is going to attack and so on. I have a lot of questions about his first three years in the office. But after start of invasion, he's doing his best. Uh, I really believe in this. But uh, speaking about this change of Supreme Military Commander, I'm not happy with this move. 
not because I doubt a new Supreme Military General, Mr. Sirsky, his abilities, but because Mr. Zaluzhny was very respected in Ukrainian society, and that was part of, you know, kind of a column or uh, one of pillars on which uh, uh, society was laying on, you know, and the belief of people in our victory uh, too. So that that was important, uh, at least from psychological point of view. Right. The president made his decision, now we have a new Supreme Commander. Final word on backup that you're getting uh, from the, the West. Uh, billions um, is uh, at the moment stalled in the United uh, States uh, Congress because of uh, domestic uh, policies there. Uh, the EU has today uh, announced this a new 5 billion euro tranche of uh, funding um, uh, for Ukraine. Your, your thoughts uh, on those two issues, please. We are very worried about uh, what's going on in the United States and it's very bad that Ukraine became part of internal political struggle and uh, these uh, supplemental is still in the Congress. I hope that U.S. congressmen uh, will finally make a decision which is in the best interest of the United States because Ukraine is fighting not just for ourselves but also on behalf of the whole free world and uh, for international order and in the best interest of the United States too. Uh, and speaking about Europe, I want to thank European leaders, Germany, France, other countries uh, who are helping Ukraine in this situation. And Europe now is trying to step in when the uh, United States are wavering and at least to win time uh, finally to finish these discussions in the United States. So I want to thank all of our allies and I hope that United States will fix their debates as soon as possible. The whole world depends on this. I'm joined now by Maria Tomak, the head of the Crimea platform. That's an initiative launched by Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and it's designed to coordinate the international response to the ongoing occupation of Crimea. Welcome to DW, Ms. Tomak. Thanks so much for your time. Do we know how many people have been forced to leave Crimea in the last 10 years, whether it's because of their ethnicity or because they reject the Russian occupation? Thank you for having me and thank you for highlighting this important issue and highlighting basically that the war in Ukraine started 10 years ago, not two years ago. That's, that's a very important thing. Um, as to your question, uh, it's really hard to estimate. We could count those people who uh, choose to flood Crimea more or less prior to the full-scale invasion of Russia. But after the full-scale invasion has started, uh, it's becoming like almost impossible because people can flee uh, Crimea only via the Russian Federation, and they normally go to third countries, to, for instance, to Turkey, to some of the EU countries that provide the asylum for uh, refugees from, from Ukraine, including, of course, Crimean Peninsula, including Germany in, in particular. So it's really hard to say. Uh, we know that uh, prior to the full-scale invasion, it was at least 120,000 uh, inter internally displaced persons, those mm -hmm. people who fled to mainland Ukraine. But that was not the uh, the full number of people because normally people do not register as IDPs and it's only course. those who are registered. Yeah. But so can after, I, ask I mean, you... we, we can say that there's more, more and more people flee because of the mobilization in the first place. OK. Can I ask you how much resistance to, to Russian rule still exists in Crimea after 10 years of occupation? That's a very good question as well, because, you know, we ourselves being engaged in the Crimean related issues for 10 years now with my colleagues, including Tamila Tasheva. So we were surprised with the number of statements and actions in support of mainland Ukraine that we have seen in Crimea since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. So prior to the full-scale invasion, there was a strong human rights movement, which was mostly based on the Crimean Tatar indigenous peoples, Crimean Tatar community. But after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, what we witness is as of now more than 700 different actions uh, that were persecuted by the Russian occupying authorities all over Crimea, like people raising Ukrainian flags, people writing comments in the social media, people making tattoos in the form of Ukrainian just map. And that's that's how it, and 
ended up being prosecuted for the so-called discreditation of the Russian army. So in various ways, people show their solidarity. And I can tell you what's the key factor now for this. It's the success of Ukrainian army in the Black Sea region, which was achieved due to the efficient actions of Ukrainian army, but of course with the support of the uh, Western uh, uh, supplied uh, mm -hmm. army weapons. Ms. Tom, can I ask you how much blame um, Ukraine's Western allies bear for this ongoing occup occupation, given that they didn't do much except protest against Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea back in 2014? Uh, unfortunately, we have to talk about that. It's not uh, so much about blame. It's about understanding the consequences of the lack of the reaction that we have seen after the 2014. We just have to acknowledge this, mm -hmm. that this reaction was not enough, was not sufficient. Mm -hmm. And that led to the fact that Russia... Uh, um, militarized Crimea and used it as a launch pad for the further aggression against Ukraine and for the full-scale invasion, basically. All right, and that is going to I'm so sorry. To I'm going to have to interrupt territory. you there because we have run out of time. But I'd like to thank you so much for joining us here on DW. Maria Tomac, head of the Crimea platform, thank you, thank you again. Thank you.